So we are on control systems 2.3 and as we move on from 2.2 where we were talking about first order systems, today we are going to talk about second order systems, a great logical progression. Okay, so second order systems are quite a bit more complicated. The math behind them is a lot more complicated and they are also much more likely to be unstable. And we are gonna talk about some of that and we are gonna go through the equations here. And so this might be a little bit longer. And if it is, hopefully that's because it's good and not because I'm just rambling incoherently. So let's talk about second order systems. With a second order system, that means that you have an S squared in the denominator. And that indicates that you have two poles down there. And since you have that, again, you have a greater chance of instability. Now with a second order system, you have your standard form, which looks like this. And now this can look like Greek, and that's because most of it is actually Greek. But what we have here is omega n squared over s squared plus two zeta. And literally my zetas are kind of squiggles, and so they're gonna be rather inconsistent. And frankly, I have no idea how to make them. That's an aside, but that is a zeta. So plus two times zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. That's the standard form of a second order system. So when you are trying to get everything ready to put into um, either a system, uh, some sort of simulation so that you can see what you're expecting to get out, whether you're trying to get your equation set up so you can figure out how to change the different parameters, you want your equation to end up looking basically like this. Now, this is one of those things where it might be a bit backwards because this may be the standard form, but this comes from real life models, um, real life transfer functions of second order systems. So in a little bit, we're going to get a real life transfer function, a second order RLC circuit, and show how that fits in with this. But right now, you just know that this is kind of the framework and the things to pay attention to are your omega n, which is your natural frequency, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. And then your zeta, which is your damping ratio, which controls uh, basically how out of control your circuit or your system will be. And again, I'm just kind of introducing the concepts right now. We're looking at this, we're gonna move on from it, but we'll come back to it and show how this applies to a real life system and how you make a real life transfer function fit with this. Okay. The key thing here to realize is that the damping ratio makes it so when you have, for example, a unit step input, your output responds in a certain way. And so your damping ratio, the way you look at that is it's something that you more generally wanna focus on to give the exact response that you want. And so that's the, the part that people tweak the most. And again, We'll get into it with the real life RLC circuit and show why that's the case. But you wanna look at this dampering ratio because if you take this system right here and you model it out and you do all of the math, you will notice that this single portion right here can give, well, modifying this single portion right here can give your output wildly different responses. So with that, I actually do want to jump right into the undamped, underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped scenarios and how those are related to the damping ratio. So let me grab a piece of paper. Okay, so if you have an undamped system where basically you go back and you look at this and this is zero, making it just S squared plus omega N squared and omega N squared over that, then the response you'll get if you have a unit step input, so you're going from zero to one, is basically your output will wildly oscillate between two and zero infinitely. So if your input is only going to one, you're actually gonna go, your output's gonna go up to two, down to zero, up to two, down to zero, up to two, down to zero. Okay, so now let's provide a real life example of this in both the mechanical and in the electrical side so you can kind of imagine what's actually happening here. So I like mechanical examples because they're easier to see. And in this case, let's imagine you have a car. So you have the mass of the car, your spring, and your shock. And so the mass of your car has inertia. The spring can store the energy and the shock absorbs the energy. So in this case, having an undamped or a zeta equals zero, that's sort of like taking your car and pulling the shock out and then 
pushing the car down and then letting it go. Now, obviously there's gonna be some resistances in real life and all of that, but if there weren't, if you imagine this is like a physics lab, you'd basically have that weight, it's pushed down on the spring, and then it'd just bounce up and down forever, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. But you don't have any shocks to absorb that energy, and so there's no damping effect, and that's why it oscillates like crazy. Now, on a circuit, an RLC circuit, you remember a resistor is like your shock, the inductor is like the weight because it, it has inertia, the current that goes through it wants to keep on going through it, and then your capacitor is like the spring in that it fills up and then it releases. So in an RLC circuit, what would happen here is that you're getting rid of your R and it's just an LC circuit, and as you put that input in there, what happens is you're charging up the inductor, it then discharges into the capacitor, the capacitor charges up the inductor, the inductor charges up the capacitor and it's just bouncing back and forth and it doesn't have anywhere to go. It isn't dissipated anywhere. Obviously in real life, there's internal resistances on your inductors and your capacitors that would cause it so that ringing would last a very minimal amount of time. But theoretically, without any internal resistances, if you had an inductor and a capacitor and you put a charge through them, they would just oscillate back and forth forever and forever unless you had a resistor. And that is because your damping ratio, zeta, is zero. All right, so now you have what is called the underdamped. And this is when your zeta or your damping ratio is between zero and one. And that is where your resistor, in this case, would be undersized if you want something to be critically damped, and we'll get to that in a moment or it would be where your shock is not able to absorb all of the energy properly. So again, going to one, if your step input goes to one, an underdamped system will kind of come up and it'll overshoot and then it'll kind of oscillate around that one before finally settling at one and continuing on forever. So with the car, that's kind of like, it gets pushed down and then it comes back up a little bit too high, settles, and then it goes like that, which is funny because I remember when I was in junior high or high school or something like that, some other punk kids jumped on somebody's pickup truck and they jumped up and down and they laughed at it because it just was bouncing too much. And I didn't understand then what that meant was the guy's shocks were completely gone. And that's because, oh, not completely gone, but they had dropped, dropped down quite a bit. And so now his truck was an underdamped system so when they jumped on it and brought it down, when they jumped off, it went up too high, went kind of like that, instead of going whoop, right back to where it was supposed to be, which would be a critically damped system. Now, you don't want this in your circuits either, because usually when you're expecting to go from zero to one, you want to go from zero to one, and only from zero to one, and you want to do it as quickly as possible. And so what you want is critically damped. So let me grab another piece of paper. Okay, so critically damped is basically the sweet spot. It's where you get from zero to one as quickly as possible. So well, without overshooting. So with your input, you have this zero to one, and then on your output, it usually looks something like this. Kind of goes up. And if everything's great, it'll look just like the RC circuit that we had in our last uh, tutorial. Just comes up nicely, goes from zero to one as quickly as possible, but without overshooting. And that is when your zeta equals one, when your damping ratio equals one. And that is the ideal. Now, I'm gonna go over the overdamped, and then sometimes I really wonder what I was thinking and why it didn't make perfect sense to me, but I'm gonna go over the overdamped and why it's not necessarily great. So with your input from zero to one, if you're overdamped and your damping ratio is greater than one, what will happen is it'll look a lot like the critical, critically damped, but it'll just take a lot longer or a little bit longer. Technically, an overdamped system is any system that gets from zero to one as a response slower than absolutely necessary. So it's nice that it's not ringing, and that's why I was confused when I first heard of this concept, like why does it matter? Well, you, you do want to get from zero to one as quickly as possible without the overshoot. And so if you take too long to get up there, then that's not the response that you want. Again, that would kind of be like you, you take your truck or your car and you push it down and then it just slowly 
really comes back up to where it's supposed to. Imagine hitting a pothole where your response is really slow. If you have a pothole and you're too bouncy, it'll jostle you all over the place. If you hit a pothole and you're not responsive enough, you'll get banged really hard because it just, it hits you and you get jounced at one time and then you just slowly move and it's basically like riding without shocks or springs whatsoever. So you want this critically damped system so you get that transition as quickly as possible without the overshot. So this is the goal, is the critically damped. Okay, so with that, let's jump into an RLC circuit, show how the RLC circuit goes along with this equation and figure out how we can calculate the damping ratio for an RLC circuit and how you come to that. And then I actually have it set up in LT Spice and we'll do a couple of simulations showing these same principles with an RLC circuit using a couple of real life values. As we went over in tutorial 1.2 and we modeled real life uh, systems, we did this, we modeled this RLC circuit. So if you're, if you're looking at this and saying, hey, where did you get this transfer function? Go back to tutorial 1.2 and you'll see exactly where we got this transfer function. So the transfer function for an RLC circuit is one over S squared LC plus SRC plus one. Now, as we look at this, we can see, ah, this S squared is all by itself. So we need to get rid of this LC. So what we'll do is we'll simply divide the top and bottom by LC or multiply it by one over LC. And that will give us one over LC over S squared plus SRC over LC plus one over L, C. Okay, so let's just cancel out these C's right here really quick. So you just have R over L. And now you look at it and you can compare the two. So you've got omega n squared over s squared plus two uh, times zeta w, w omega n s plus omega n squared. Okay, so looking at this, you can see that s squared s squared, that's great. Our one over LC is omega n squared. So we can just write that out to the side right now that omega n squared equals one over LC. And a very common mistake I make is forgetting that's omega n squared because what that will actually give you is omega equals one over the square root of LC. Don't make that mistake. I make that mistake. You don't get to. All right, then we can look at this and we have our, we'll just take this middle here and we have the S R over L is equal to two zeta omega N S. And that's why we needed this omega N over here. All right, I'm gonna grab another piece of paper so that I don't confuse myself more. Just a moment. Okay, so the first thing we can do here is just get rid of those S's. And now we simply have R over L equals two times the damping ratio, omega n. And since we know omega n is one over LC, we can do R over L equals two omega, oh man, it's just getting worse and worse, times one over the square root of LC. Okay, so now that's a little bit more simplified. Now we wanna get this damping ratio by itself. So let's divide it over here and get this all over here. So we have, R over L, 2L times square root of LC equals zeta. And the final way we can simplify this is simply R over two times the square root of C over L equals the damping ratio. Okay, so now, Again, we gotta take this all back together and we take it back and look at this original equation and we see that this damping ratio that we pulled from the transfer function right here is calculated by R over two times the square root of C over L. So if you want to modify the damping ratio, you can change your capacitance, your inductance, or your resistance. So you want this damping ratio to equal one so that you get a critically damped system. And in this case, that means you can modify your C and your L and your R. So this whole equation comes out to one. 
Now, in real life, it's going to depend on what you're working with, the parameters that you're working with. But for us, we can look at this and basically say, well, let's just say capacitance and inductance is one farad and one henry, and then this turns into a one, and then it's very easy to just say R just needs to be two to get us a critically damped system. So again, looking at that, for this to equal one, we can just assume, because magic, Farad, one farad, one henry, and then two ohms to have two over two, making that one times the square root of one, one equals one. And that will give us our critically damped system. That being said, if we keep our capacitance as one, our inductance as one, and make our resistance zero, well, then it goes crazy. If we make our resistance 0.1, then we will be under damped and will flow out like that. And if we make our resistance five, then it'll just take a really long time to fill up. And we could keep the resistance solid and just modify the capacitance and the inductance. But since there's that square root sign in the division, it just makes it a little bit more complicated to get exactly what we want. And it's a lot easier to modify the resistance, which is what we're going to do. So I'm going to switch over to my LT Spice simulation, and I'm going to show you this exact circuit this exact circuit using the exact values that I just discussed, and we will see what the different time responses are. And just want to say that, again, this is just for experimental purposes. In reality, finding a one farad capacitor and a one Henry inductor is pretty intense. So you're not going to be able to set this up in your lab. But that being the case, if you have a resistor, inductor, and capacitor of enough different values, you can calculate this out, plug it in, and you'll hook it up to your oscilloscope, and that voltage over the capacitor should change exactly according to this. Yes, it should change exactly according to this equation, and you should have it look exactly as you would expect. So let's jump over to LT Spice, get that set up and going, and uh, that'll be very exciting. Okay, so here I have created four identical circuits. We have our RLC, and then I set, up, set it up as a transient response over a 25 second period, because again, if we have a one farad capacitor and a one Henry inductor, that's pretty big and it's gonna be a very slow response. In reality, most of the values you're gonna be dealing with are going to be in the milliseconds, microseconds, eh, probably milliseconds or microseconds. Okay, so, we can run the simulation and then we will take a voltage over these different capacitors and going from left down, top down, this is the undamped, underdamped, critically damped with that two ohms and then overdamped with the five ohms right here. So let's run that simulation. There we go. Now we will probe right there. Uh, exactly as we were expecting, we are going from zero to two volts and just oscillating wildly back and forth, back and forth. Now let's look at our underdamped system. There we go. We get it coming up and it's oscillating around one volt before finally ending. Well, probably it looks like it's still zigzagging a little bit, even past the 25 second mark. So that is obviously underdamped. Now this should be the critically damped Yep, right there, you can see it jumps up and in oh, about five seconds, it hits five or six seconds, it hits the one volt mark and doesn't have any overshoot whatsoever. It doesn't go above one volt at all. And then our overdamped has the same thing, but it takes instead of five to six seconds, it looks like it doesn't hit that one point mark until almost 25 seconds. And that is with a resistance value of five. So this is a real life control system, second order system, and how it reacts differently with the different, different damping ratios. So that's really exciting stuff. Frankly, all of this is pretty interesting. I, again, just like I said with the first order systems, I love this stuff because it's real, it's tangible, it's something where you do the math, you get some crazy numbers here, yet it all comes out and produces something that you can say, this is exactly what I expected, and that is so incredibly exciting. So let's go over this again really quick. Let me grab my papers so we can just do a quick summary and review. So again, today we talked about standard form of a second order system and how it has a S, an S squared 
in the bottom, uh, in the denominator, that's the official term, is the bottom of the fraction. So that's where you have the S squared in the denominator. We talked about the damping ratio. We talked about the natural frequency, that omega n. We talked about how the RLC circuit has a transfer function that you can then take and put into the form of this standard second order system. And then we showed how that mathematical calculation comes out and actually shows us something with our real simulations. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed preparing for it and talking about it. This is a very exciting topic. We will be continuing on with control systems because there's still so much more to learn. If you did learn something and you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, all that good jazz, and we will catch you in the next one. Take care. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. Did you know that circuitbread.com has more than tutorials? One of the other many things that we have are several excellent open source textbooks that benefit from our search tools, highlighting, super fast page changes, and keyboard friendly navigation. Go check them out.